but still it's a beautiful day. The spring is upon us. We enjoy the warmer weather. We have a few announcements we'd like to make before we begin our worship services. First of all, we're grateful for all our guests that are with us this morning. We have those that are out of town and, and others that perhaps are local, but we're glad that you're here. We hope to have opportunity to visit with you after services and get to know you even better. We would like to encourage our members as well as our guests, if you would, to fill out a card so that we'd have a record of you being with us. Um, we would like to uh, encourage you to take the card. Following our Lord's Supper, we will pass an offering, and you can put that card in the offering plate, and then we'll have that to, to put down in our records. Those that we need to remember <clears throat> in our prayers, we need to continue to remember Colt Krausen. Has a surgery been set? No surgery yet. Huh? So, I know it's very discouraging for Colt, ready to get this process moving. Scott Wallace, good to see him here. Any results yet? Not yet, but hopefully in the next week or so, find out the results of the biopsy that was done on his throat. Emily Bishop, Brenda Jones' daughter, had surgery on her leg last Thursday. Everything's well, and we're grateful for that. Um, Chuck Tracy is going to be going to the heart hospital on Thursday. He's going to be having some tests done. He's having some issues with his uh, pulmonary, with his breathing and things, so they're going to be running some tests for that. And let's remember Chuck. It's great to see Stacy Culver with us this morning, and we're grateful for that. Others we want to remember is Jeanette Fuller, and Ed Fuller, their Jeanette sister, Shara Buck, Larry Rigsby, Keith Vanderbosch, Elsie Purnell, Gary Carter, Alan Rathman, Joy Henry, Amy Rinke, uh, Jim Pratt, and Jill Meggie. Today is Brothers Keepers Sunday. So all the various Brothers Keepers groups, those that are involved in, in that uh, program will be meeting uh, at various homes at various times. If you're not a part of Brothers Keepers and you would like to find out more about it, be involved in it, or see if you want to be involved in it, you can visit with Richard Bonnet, one of our elders. You can come visit with me as well. I highly encourage and recommend uh, everyone to be a part of our Brothers Keepers groups. On Wednesday nights, we've been going through Parables from the Pews is the title of our series where various members of our congregation have been presenting lessons on parables. Lonnie Goff did it last week, and I believe Gage is this week. So Gage Goff is this week. Look forward to that. For those who would like to come early, I found a new term. I'm stealing it, all right, so it's not my idea. Uh, fast Food Fellowship, 6 o'clock. Isn't that good? I wish I would thought of it. Fast Food Fellowship at 6 o'clock on Wednesdays. Come on and uh, bring something uh, and enjoy that time together of fellowship. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And that means we'll be having an Easter egg hunt at Petty John Springs following our morning services at noon until 3 p.m. Hot dogs will be provided. Everyone's asked to uh, come and just enjoy the fellowship, whether you've got kids or grandkids or not. It's an enjoyable time. And uh, bring sides, chips, dip, desserts, drinks, desserts. Um, we need lots of that. Also, families with children, if you could bring two dozen plastic candy-filled eggs for the children to hunt later that afternoon, that's a lot of fun, watch those kids hunting those eggs. Uh, bring a lawn chair, it's outside. It'll be in the shades and, and things, and it, it's just a, a blessing to be, to be a part of that. Congratulations to Caden Howard and John Marino. A couple's wedding shower for them will be May 1st, 2022 in the Fellowship Hall from 2 to 4. They are registered at Bed Bath & Beyond, Walmart, and Amazon, and their wedding date is May the 30th. VBS is being planned July 25th to the 28th. We're still making plans on that. We've got great turnout, great ideas, and great involvement. Secret Grandparents, um, we're going to be signing up for a 12-week period of Secret Grandparents. Uh, and uh, we had several that signed up on Wednesday. And if you'd be interested in being a part of our Secret Grandparents and have yet to sign up, if you would put your name on a card and give it to me, 
I forgot to bring the sign-up sheet over, and I'll forget if you tell me. But if you have the, bring me the card, I'll, I'll get it written down. Uh, it's a wonderful thing that we're doing just for 12 weeks this summer. Uh, ministry workshop. Uh, the, uh, we're, we're providing a, a lot of help for this. It, it is uh, April 29th to 30th. If God wrote my to-do list, it's for youth ministers. And we appreciate all the work that Petty John Springs does. I've got one note from the Hallmark family. Thank you for all the many calls, texts, cards, visits, meals, prayers, and support during the recent loss of our mother and grandmother, Lily Hallmark. We're so thankful for your love and support. With love and gratitude, the Hallmark family. We're grateful for that. Grateful to be a part of a congregation that's so very supportive and loving, shows such great concern and compassion for each other, and it is a blessing to be a part of this congregation in Medill. Look forward to our worship together this morning. Encourage you to sing songs with us and pray together and to, to listen to a portion of God's word. Richard Bonnet will be our song leader this morning. Good morning, church. Let's sing to our Father this morning. What a fellowship, what a joy
Truly, I can tell all of you, I, I thank very much the help, the encouragement, the money, the prayers. Uh, I want you to know you truly have humbled me. Uh, I've been humbled from across the United States. I, I just can't believe the outpouring that has come my way. And I don't ever want to go through another storm to find it again, okay? <laughs> I decided that in the 15 seconds we had to get in the cellar, God must have decided I'm not done harassing you people. So that's why I'm still here, okay? So hang on. We're going to have more fun. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your greatness, for your ability to control many things. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your understanding. And, Lord, we thank you for your patience. We're a trying bunch, Lord, and these are some trying times. And we just ask you to guide us and to protect us. We ask that you be with our elders. We ask you be with our deacons, our Sunday school teachers, our preachers, everybody that is working to make this one of your churches. So as we go through and as we live our lives, we thank you for helping guide us and help protect us. We're mindful of those that are suffering from sickness, and we thank you for your healing powers. Lord, we're mindful of those that have sinned or have sinned in their way of living, and we know, God, that that's an eternal illness if that's not corrected. So help us to help them to understand. Protect us always is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This uh, beautiful song speaks to me and us about how much Jesus loved us and what he gave up to come here and give up his life for us. No palace, no jewels, no kingdom. Yeah. 
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the love that you have for us. And Father, that that you did send your son. And Father, that he did come and, and he died for us. Father, he, uh, he loved us uh, enough to, to give his life. And you loved us enough to send your son. Father, now as we partake of this bread, which represents the broken body on that cross, Father, let us always remember that is the song we just sang, that our Savior still came, and he loved us, in your son's name. Again, Father, we come thanking you so much for the great sacrifice that was given us. And Father, now as we reflect back on the cross where Jesus suffered and died and gave his life for us, Father, let us always remember the seriousness of, of what we're doing and help us to remember the great love and sacrifice that your son did for, uh, gave for us as we partake of this fruit of the vine. Father, let us remember that it represents the blood which is shed for us and the love that was given us. In your son's name, amen.
Lord's Supper has been completed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, Father, for watching out for us, taking care of, for <clears throat> taking care of us, and, and loving us like you do. And Father, at this time, we have an opportunity to give back a portion of that which you have so richly blessed us with. And Father, help us to always uh, give in a loving manner as you give. We thank you so much for your son, in his name, amen. Fifteenth book of Luke, verses uh, one through ten. And this is a, a well-known parable that Luke is describing here for us. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, "This man receives sinners and eats with them." So he spoke this parable to them, saying, "What man of you, having a hundred sheep?" If he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And, we is, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you likewise that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repeats, then over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. 
Likewise, I say to you, there is no joy. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Probably don't tell him enough. Talking about John Thomas, how much I appreciate him. When I preached in Winniewood for 11 years, it was me. I did everything, including the bulletin and folding the bulletin. We did. I did 120 bulletins every week. Usually on Sunday morning, I'd get up early and run them off. And I would take. 10 bulletins at a time and a pencil and I would fold them and then crease them really good until I had all 120 of them done, 10, uh, 12 groups of 10. And then you separate them and things and put them, we put them outside. And I remember the, going to Mangum and I still did the bulletins, but they had a folding machine. And I thought that's a greatest thing that I'd ever seen was a bulletin folding machine and I didn't have to do it by hand any longer. What a relief that was. What a blessing that was. But at Mangum, we began using PowerPoints and um, one of the things that I did every week was come up with all the announcements that would scroll uh, across and who's doing what and or who's sick and things and and uh, try to try to make it somewhat different every week but it wasn't always different it wasn't very attractive and then I get to Medill and John Thomas you don't understand how long it takes when you see the the the, the announcement scrolling before worship and after worship how long it takes to find all those and put them up there and uh, to change them every week. And he does an incredible job with that, and I appreciate that so very much. He's also working with some of our men that have offered to learn how to do the, uh, uh, do the uh, uh, PowerPoint to our worship service, and I appreciate that as well as we get more people involved with, uh, with that. Am I on here? I don't think I'm on here. Anyway, I just want to share that with you. I know you've seen it, but sometimes we see things we take for granted that it's easy. Well, it's not. It's not. All right, let's see if we can get going here. Okay. There have been an incredible amount of advances, remarkable advances when it comes to vision. I remember it's about 13, 14 years ago, I had gone quail hunting and I saw my dog down about 500 yards, 600 yards out of the way, but there he was, he was down on point and I needed to go over there. I walked 600 yards over there, and maybe I should say six miles it seemed like, only to find out that it was a feed sack that had blown out of somebody's truck. And it wasn't a dog. I had I couldn't see long distance, real blurry. So I called my brother, who's an optometrist. He said, "Todd, you need LASIK surgery. Let me call my man that I use, the ophthalmologist that I use." And, and I had LASIK surgery. Now I wear glasses, but that's just to read. And long distance. I can see, except for when I hit my drive, those go out of sight. But everything. That's for Randy. <laughs> it's incredible though, right? I don't know if any of you have had it, but it is nice. These are just readers now that I wear. But I love it that I can wear sunglasses and things. It's incredible that they came up with this, this procedure where they can take that uh, vision and improve it like that. Now, I talked to my brother this week about some other things that have happened, and these might be some that you're more familiar with. There is what's called multifocal intraocular lenses. 
And that's when you have surgery, cataract surgery, and they cleared all that out, and then they put a lens in. Maybe this is what Lou's doing. I don't know. They put a lens in, and it enables patients to see very clearly at a distance and an intermediate and also nearsighted as well with no glasses whatsoever. You don't have to put contact in and out. I mean, they are put there under your retina or whatever it is, and, and they're, they're there. Isn't that amazing that you can get old as Randy and not have to wear glasses anymore if you want to have that? My brother, my brother said that he's just waiting until he's 65, and then uh, he's going to do that. Multifocal intraocular lenses. Another, if you don't want to wait till then and have that surgery, now they have multifocal contacts. I wore contacts for a while that were heavy on one side, and you could see, and oh, it was a pain. But now these are different. It enables patients above 45 to see clearly, distance, and near with no glasses whatsoever. The advances are unbelievable that they've come up with. But there's one that I saw that's different. Now these restore the vision that you once had. But this other that I saw on uh, some little, I don't know, Facebook, YouTube, something. Deteropia. Anybody know what deteropia is? Or tritona, oh, tritonoropia? Tritona, tritonopia. I don't even know how to s- pronounce it. Y'all know anybody that's colorblind? I know a couple. Can't always remember who, but I just knew there were a couple that were colorblind. This first is when you're colorblind to red or green. You can't see red or green. The other is, and it's mostly men that had that. The other is where you're colorblind to blue or yellow. Can you imagine going through life and you can't see red or green or or blue or yellow? I found something. I want to share it with you. You'll have to listen quietly. All we could get is the the volume through the the, uh, projector. But I hope that you'll listen to this, and, and uh, then we'll use that to launch into our lesson this morning. Can you start it? There. Go ahead. I I went the wrong way. There you go. Can you imagine? He looked to be in his 60s at least and had never seen those colors before until he put those glasses on. You saw the reaction that he had to see something he'd never seen before. He'd heard about it. I'm sure they try to explain what yellow is or what blue is or whatever it was he's colorblind to, but you can't adequately explain color. And how he felt, you could see a little bit of it when he could see those colors. It's unbelievable. Now, imagine if we could put glasses on and see something like we've never seen before. 
perhaps see something better than what we might know, but we can't imagine. And what I'm talking about is this. What if we could put glasses on that enabled us to see things the way Christ sees things, the way he saw things? Being able to look at things from Christ's point of view, I'm sure it might be different than what we might anticipate or think about. And there might be a way. We can't literally do that. But there might be a way that we could do that. And I think it's important. We're going to take the next parable of this great chapter in Luke chapter 15. It's considered the the great chapter of all chapters. It's considered the gospel within the gospel. This Luke chapter 15. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Now, Jesus was being ridiculed, was being criticized for uh, eating with sinners and associating and fellowshipping with publicans and sinners, with the people that you're not supposed to. He had just been to a party with Matthew, who had thrown a party. He was a a tax collector, and Jews don't do that. And so Jesus is going to tell a story. And in this story, in these stories, uh, we kind of get an idea of what Christ sees in certain things. And I want us to take that idea and look at this, because... um, It's important that we understand how Jesus views certain things, and it might, it it might be life changing. It might be, oh, I I hadn't thought about that, or I hadn't thought about it enough. The first thing that we see that I want to bring out that how Jesus views sin. Now he's painting this story. He's telling this these uh, these stories of these three parables he's he's trying to describe sin and how he views sin and we look at sin the way Jesus looks at sin if you look in verse 12 we'll start in verse 11 then he said a man had two sons and then verse 12 he says the younger of them said to his father father give me the share of the estate that falls with me so he divided his wealth between him one thing that Jesus seems to be saying about sin because the story goes where this man goes down to a far country and he sins. As Jesus is making sure that his listeners understand, and we understand that sin does attract. It does cause us to want to leave home and go off somewhere else. It causes us to want to do things that, that deep down we know we shouldn't do. It attracts. Sin is attractive. And to ignore this, that it attracts. To try to tell your kids, oh, sin is bad. The answer is no. The result of sin, what sin does is bad. Sin is very attractive. And never forget that. To ignore it is to invite Satan free reign in our lives. It's important that we prepare ourselves, we remind ourselves, and we tell everyone else that sin is something that's going to look good. But it's really not. But Jesus says, do not misjudge the attractiveness of sin. That we need to be on guard with things around us. Because sin will try to draw us away from home. A place where we'll find a lot of bad things. As a matter of fact, verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. He squandered, he wasted all that he had, all that was his, all that his father had worked for, all that was given to him. He says he wasted it with sin, with loose living, that thing that attracted him, and he wasted it all, squandered it all. There's nothing left for him whatsoever. He left with a pocket full of money and big dreams of of making himself something. And what happened? Waste. 
Sin does the same thing. We need to realize sin promises a lot, but it ends up costing us more than we could ever pay. That it promises everything and gives us nothing. And that's what Jesus is saying about sin. Realize there's nothing to it that's good. Verse 14. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred and he began to be impoverished. Can you imagine the disappointment that he must have felt after he'd lost everything and he thought about his home and thought about his father and thought about what he had done and how he had nothing left? The embarrassment that he must have felt, the shame that he was going through. He had nothing to show for the inheritance that had been given him. Nothing and no one. He had no friends to turn to, no one to help him out, no one to do anything for him. And I want to tell you, Jesus is really painting this picture, showing us his vision of sin, that when you get caught in, up in it, when you get entangled in it, then you will be disappointed and you'll find that you have nothing of value, nothing of worth, and you'll have really no true friends any longer. Sin disappoints. That's how Jesus looks at sin. Not only that, he says, So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and sent him into his fields to feed swine. You're talking about rock bottom. You're talking about going against everything that you've been raised up to do and believe and work toward. Now he's feeding pigs, that unhealthy, unclean animal. And he had no choice, but I got to go work. I got to go try to survive. I got to do this. And he was enslaved in this p position of doing something that he hated. Sin does the same today. It, it crafts the beautiful spider web that looks beautiful, but draws in the insects only to trap and end up destroying. Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6 beginning in verse 12, about being slaves to sin, slaves in righteousness. He said, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and, and members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. What then shall we sin? Because we're not under law but under grace, he said, may it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves, for obedience, your slaves are the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. <clears throat> this young man showed this picture of being enslaved to sin and doing something he didn't want to do. Jesus says sin will put you there. And then finally, it's degrading. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving him anything to him. So hungry, I'll eat what the pigs are eating. How degrading, how lost, how empty, how unfulfilled. Paul would talk about knowing the right thing to do but not doing it, knowing the wrong thing to do and doing it even though he knows it's wrong. And sin does that as well. It degrades us to the point that we're ashamed. We don't want to be around anybody that once knew us. So Jesus says, put these glasses on and understand sin is attractive, but it wastes everything that you have it will not give you what you want. You'll be disappointed. You'll find yourself enslaved to sin and doing things you could have never imagined. The second thing that we see in this story that Jesus is, is painting this picture of, sharing his vision, is that of conversion. 
of going from this place of sin back to where you're supposed to be. We see, first of all, for one to be converted, to escape that place of sin, the first thing that he needs to do or she needs to do is come to their senses. Look what he says. But when he came to his senses, the King James says when he came to his right mind, Jesus says, shows us this vision that until you're ready, until you come to your senses, until you realize that where you're at is not where you need be, that you can't be converted. You see, there's no salvation until there is remorse or regret or repentance. There's no forgiveness of sins until one sees the need for forgiveness. There's no coming to our senses until we realize that I've been making some crazy, dumb mistakes and I can do better. You see, that was a problem with the Pharisees. They, they didn't come to their senses that they needed a Savior too. And it's a problem today. People see sin, but they don't see a Savior. They don't see a need for a Savior. There are people that are entangled in sin, and they've been overcome by sin, and they become numb to sin, and they don't need, they think they don't need a Savior. Jesus says, first, you have to realize, look, I'm wrong. I need better. I can do better. I need to change. And then he comes to a decision. That's part of conversion is making that decision. Yes, I'm going to do what I know is right. Verse 18 and 19. I I will get up and, and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy. There's that humility. Coming to a sense that I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he says, I'm going to go home. I'm going back to my father. But I'll be humble. I'll be understand that I've done some bad things. And I'm going to repent. This decision to leave where we're at we call that repentance to turn away from where we were and go back to where we need to be that's repentance that's to to walk away from that and to go home that's godly sorrow paul says in second corinthians 7 verse 10 that worldly sorrow is a repentance unto death Godly sorrow is a repentance unto life. There's two types of sorrow. The worldly sorrow is, man, I'm, I can't believe I got caught. Next time I'm going to be more careful and not get caught. Where godly sorrow, that's true repentance that leads to life, is coming to a decision saying, I don't want to do this ever again. I want to leave this place. That's what Jesus says. That's conversion that's godly sorrow we need to have godly sorrow and not worldly sorrow and then the third thing about this view that Jesus portrays this vision that he has that he wants to share with us is his view of salvation oh what a wonderful view it is you see, he goes back in verse 22. He, verse 20, he, so he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, and ran, embraced him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But Jesus' view of sin is that the father ignores all your past. I don't care what you were and what you did. All I know is you're here. And he says in verse 22, The father said, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. The best robe. Can you imagine how he must have smelled? If he had much clothes at all. He'd been in a pig pen and didn't have any food to feed himself. Certainly didn't have any 
clothes to, to put on to present himself to his father. There's no telling what he was like. And the father said, get that stuff off and get the best robe. Old things thrown out. Old garnets done away. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. Paul says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. He goes on to say in verse 9 and 10, uh, that, uh, verse 10, that you've put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the old one who created him. Paul says in Romans 6 that when we're baptized into Christ, we arise to walk in newness of life. So we put on a robe. Galatians 3 says we clothe ourselves with Christ when we're baptized into him. That's what salvation is. It's getting rid of those stinky, smelly things for the past. Second of all, he says in verse 2, and put a ring on his finger. That ring was a sign that this is my son. You remember when Joseph was put in a position of authority right under Pharaoh, Pharaoh gave him his ring as a sign of his place, his position, his authority. And here in the story, Jesus says, when you come back, when you understand that sin is wasteful and painful and wrong, and you really come to your senses, then you'll be given a, a ring as being a, a son of God. A symbol of, of authority. And then he says, bring the sandals. Shoes were something that were a sign of service. You took your shoes off when you went into the house, and you put them on when you went out to work. And Jesus says, my view of salvation is that you're going to be Put back to work. Put back to doing the things that you once did. It's a symbol of freedom. Slaves had no shoes. Shoes were worn by those that were free. Those that were, that were to be great servers. And there was no... I like the idea that, that he was not put on probation. Salvation is not being put on probation having to prove yourselves. Right away, the robe, the ring shoes and then all oh, the banquet bring the fattened calf kill it let us eat let us celebrate Jesus says when someone is converted it is a time of celebration really that's the story of all three parables isn't it the, the, the shepherd who came back with the one sheep that was lost and found and they had a celebration and the woman that found the one coin that had been lost and she told her neighbors they had a celebration there was great joy and Jesus says greater joy cannot be found in heaven there's great joy in heaven greater joy than anywhere else when that which is lost is found Jesus view of salvation that it's the best Vision. Sometimes I wish that we could put on glasses that could see the way Christ did. There are other things that we need to see as well. But it would be life changing if we understood all that sin is and all that sin did. And all that sin does through the eyes of Christ. It's what put him on the cross. Bearing our sins. It would be life changing to have the vision of Christ. We also see God's vision in this. The one who left the 99 to go search for that one that was lost. The woman who had ten coins and lost one and she searched diligently until she found it. And the father who apparently scanned the horizon every day praying that the son would come to his senses. 
to come home. God's vision is that He loves each one of us. And He's done His part to provide for us a means to be converted, to experience salvation. Jesus would say, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus would say in Luke 13, 3, Unless you repent, come to your senses, turn away from sin. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus would say, Whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever does not confess me, him will I not confess before my Father who is in heaven. We have to confess. That's that coming to our senses and going back home and saying, Father, I've sinned. And then we need to put on the rope. Galatians 3. Knowing now that all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And then put those shoes, those sandals of service. Be faithful unto death. I give you a kind of life. We see God's vision of the lost and his desire to save in this story as well. But I hope that we'll look at that. At sin conversion and that salvation it can be life changing if you need to respond to the gospel to the Lord's invitation I encourage you to come now as we stand and as we sing disdain shall we seek thee Lord in vain shall we seek thee Lord in vain Lord on thee our souls
Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this wonderful Lord's Day that we've had to come together freely and worship you and, and study your word and, and enjoy fellowship with one another. We pray that our service this morning was holy and acceptable in your sight and was sweet music to your ears. Lord, we just pray for the many who are struggling at this time. We pray for those who are sick, those who are battling various diseases or illnesses or injuries, and we just pray that you would restore each one of them to their health, and that in the meantime, you would bring them comfort and peace. We also pray for those who have lost loved ones. We just pray that you surround them with comfort and, and love and strength during this difficult time. And Lord, we pray for those who have turned away from you that you would just put it in their hearts to, to come back home and to see your vision. And we just pray that however we can be instruments in helping those who are lost or who are suffering, that you would put those opportunities in front of us. Lord, we just pray as we leave here that you keep us safe and let us all return back at the next appointed time. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.